This is Duke University. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Hicks. I'm with the Duke University Energy Initiative, and welcome to the Mellon Seminar on Venezuela's industry, uh, oil industry outlook. This is a unique opportunity for you to explore a very complex set of issues in the energy space. This is a part of a series, part of by the Center for Canadian Studies on the Geopolitics of Energy in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so pay attention, there will be others that come forward, but this is a wonderful event and we're glad you made it. This could not be possible without the uh, contributions for several organizations. I want to list them all to make sure you're aware of them. Certainly the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the Office of the Provost for Duke University, the Center for International Studies, the Center for Latin America and Caribbean Studies, the Fuqua School of Business right across the street, and the Sanford Energy and Environment Club, and the Duke University Ener Energy Initiative. And for those of you that don't know, the Energy Initiative is a campus-wide interdisciplinary initiative that focuses on issues in the energy industry and challenges both economic and environment around the world. So thank you very much for coming. I would like to introduce uh, Matthias Kimmel, who is uh, co-president of the Sanford Energy Club, and he will introduce our moderator today. Thank you, Thank you Matthias. My name is Matthias Kimmel. I'm one of the co-presidents of the Sanford Energy and Environment Club. And I'm very happy that we can host this event here today. Thank you to Steve and David and the rest of the Duke Energy Initiative for this opportunity. Um, I think we're going to have a very great panel today about uh, Venezuela and we have our uh, moderator here, um, Patrick Dadi, and he actually served um, as um, the ambassador to the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela for both President Bush and President Obama, so I think that will be a great discussion because you are an expert, you have the background and you have two people who know a lot about Venezuela <coughs> as well. Um, Patrick Dutt is currently a visiting senior lecturer um, at the Duke University Center for International Studies where he um, served previously as a diplomat in residence. And prior to his assignment to Venezuela, Ambassador Dutt served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the West Western Hemisphere. In that capacity, he was directly responsible for the Office of Economic Policy and Summit Coordination which included the hemispheric energy portfolio as well for the offices of Brazil, Southern Core Affairs, and Caribbean Affairs. Before his assignment in Brazil, Patrick Dadi served in a var variety of senior positions around the hemisphere, including as the Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in La Paz, Bolivia, and as Counselor for Public Affairs at the U.S. Embassy in Panama. Early in his career, he also served as US Embassy in U.S. Embassies in Paraguay, Costa Rica, the Dominican Republic and Chile. And before I hand to Patrick, who is going to introduce the panelists, I want to quickly say something about our club. We are the Sanford Energy Environment Club, a smaller club of public policy students who are interested in energy policy, environmental policy, water policy, international <coughs> development. We host a few events during the year. For example, we had a get together with a professor already. We um, help coordinate a panel for the Duke Energy um, Conference and for the Energy um, Industry Fundamentals. Now I'm going to head, hand to Patrick Dunn. Thanks. Um, I'm going to begin with a few uh, remarks about um, Venezuela and the energy sector and then introduce our uh, two speakers. And I will be brief and then um, uh, allow them the bulk of um, our time for formal presentations and with luck, we'll have plenty of time for a conversation afterwards in which um, you can ask uh, questions directly of our two visiting speakers. Uh, first, why are we thinking about Venezuela at all in this context? It's an obvious question, but I'm going to give you a couple of the basics. Venezuela presently is viewed as having the largest conventional reserves of oil in the world. So let's just start with that, set that aside. The largest conventional reserves, according to most estimates in the world. Our, our, um, our speakers can both parse that statement and give you more detail uh, and, and a sense of whether it is actually a modest evaluation or an exaggeration. 
Secondly, histor historically, obviously, the United States has been the largest market um, for petroleum in the world. And for many years, Venezuela was the largest foreign supplier to the United States. <clears throat> its position in the US market has eroded substantially. It's now, depending on practically the day of the week, the third, fourth, or fifth largest foreign supplier to the United States. But at the same time, <clears throat> it is also worth noting that the US is now producing more oil itself and uh, using slightly less and therefore importing less. Ergo, Venezuela, less important than it used to be in absolute terms, less important um, to the United States in, uh, relative to other foreign suppliers, is clearly, clearly figures um, uh, somewhat less prominently in um, the US, from the US perspective. Nevertheless, <clears throat> nevertheless, Venezuela is immensely important within our hemisphere in no small measure because uh, um, they have sought to build energy relationships with a wide range of the smaller economies, particularly through a program called the Petro Caribe Initiative, which offers deeply discounted or concessionary financing to many of the smaller um, island nations in the Caribbean basin. Uh, Venezuela has also become the principal source of petroleum to Cuba and, of course, in, um, uh, in, in doing so, um, to some degree, has stepped into a role vacated by the Soviet Union <clears throat> and critics of the, both Venezuela and of the Cuban regime um, argue that to some extent, Venezuela has allowed the Cuban regime to remain viable long after its own economic policies might have precipitated its collapse. That's a very debatable point from, um, from you know, I, I think, um, but it is nevertheless an essential part, partner to Cuba. Finally, um, Venezuela has become an important source of um, petroleum for China. And, and with um, Evan Ellis here, who's, um, uh, I'll give you a, a longer introduction in just a sec, but who's recently uh, published a, um, uh, a book on the strategic, um, uh, in what do they call it, strategic dimension of Chinese investment in the Americas. He can explain a little bit how that relationship works. <clears throat> now, those, if you will, largely undebatable facts, lar uh, a lar large reserves, a still significant role with the United States, and actually an expanded um, role within the Western Hemisphere, an important supplier of, of oil to, uh, to China and also India and a number of other places, um, would, to some degree, in and of themselves, justify um, a, a couple of hours of, of careful consideration of where their energy sector is going. This is made more urgent, you know, um, I believe, because the Venezuelan economy appears to be in such terribly um, uh, bad shape. They, they have entered a, a period in which um, production, oil production, has drifted downward. Right? The productivity of other sectors has practically collapsed. Inflation has risen above 50 percent. Scarcity um, has become a major feature of Venezuelan life. They, they, now, they now keep and regularly discuss a scarcity index, um, which at, at present uh, suggests that 22% of all of the 100 or so items on the, on the basic list of, of regular consumer goods, 22% at any given time can't be found. And the newspapers are filled with photographs at times of store shelves that are actually empty. Um, reminding us of the worst days of, of, of the Soviet Union. Uh, um, there's also considerable um, uh, criminal violence, surging criminal violence. Um, and the, um, the, the current administration of, 
of uh, Nicolas Maduro has in fact sought and been granted um, what are called extraordinary powers or enabling powers in order to govern by decree for a period of time, uh, uh, justifying such extraordinary powers on, on the notion that he, he needs um, uh, additional authorities to fight what, what they are calling an economic war on the Venezuelan economy, alleging that said war is being precipitated by um, recalcitrant elements of the right and, and Venezuela's international enemies. Right? Also highly debatable. Uh, nevertheless, we're at a critical moment. This is a, a, a major um, uh, energy supplier to, to the region and to the global community, a, a major exporter, uh, uh, an important economy in the hemisphere, and it appears to be in really deep trouble. Today, we're very fortunate to have with us here at Duke to discuss these issues two terrific exports, fr uh, experts, fr uh, exports. Francisco, who is an export in his own, in his own, in his own way, um, his, uh, his resume, which some of you have on the, uh, the handouts, um, is really quite amazing. But every time I see this on the board, I have to chuckle. He is um, uh, visiting faculty at Harvard, associate faculty um, at Tufts, also at Rice, at the Business Institute in um, IESA in Venezuela. And as he reminded me, he is also periodically on the faculties of several other universities. Now, I, I'm not quite sure uh, um, uh, how he manages to be in that many places, even um, uh, sequentially, let alone all at, all at once. Um, but he is um, an expert on the Venezuelan energy sector and is in demand globally. I know that in preparation for a class, I've been teaching at, at, uh, uh, at Fuqua. One of the pieces I, I've, uh, I was reviewing on um, the, the uh, sort of national oil monopolies within the hemisphere, something you, I think, actually did with, for Aramco and presented in Saudi Arabia. As we were getting ready for today's session, he was emailing me from Albania. So straight from Albania today, I, 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 we, we bring you Francisco Monaldi, and I'll, I'll do an introduction of uh, Evan Ellis afterwards. So, Francisco. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Um, thank you. <laughs> I'm <clears throat> very glad to be here. So, I will try to, to show you uh, uh, a few uh, sort of ideas to get a sense of what both the oil industry in Venezuela, uh, what's happening there, and, and a little bit of the wider context in the country, because I think it's hard to understand what is happening without understanding the larger context. So first of all, I mean, uh, I have a lot of slides showing that Venezuela has the largest uh, oil reserves in the world, but I will uh, put a sort of an asterisk on that, on that fact. But it's, it's amazing to notice that South America, because of the incorporation of the extra heavy oil of, of Venezuela um, uh, into, into proved res, uh, proven reserves, has surpassed the Middle East, not in total reserves, uh, uh, that's important too, but in the number of years of reserves at the current extraction rate. So, so that, on the one hand, tells you that South America, in particular Venezuela, has huge reserves. On the other hand, it tells you that Venezuela is producing very little oil because, because the reason why it has so many years uh, of production is because it produces very little compared to Saudi Arabia. Uh, but, I mean, in the region, uh, Venezuela has 80 88% of the reserves of all Latin America, and the next country is Brazil, that it's going to increase this significantly, but still it's far uh, uh, from, from Venezuela, from the Venezuelan figures. Uh, let me move here. So the, Venezuela has an historic opportunity to develop the oil sector. It, it, by the way, it has already lost uh, a decade of an amazing opportunity to develop the oil sector, but still has uh, uh, one because of very high oil prices, as you know, I mean, the price of oil, it's, uh, uh, I mean, only reached a peak in 2008, but very sh short lasted. But in the last uh, uh, three years, it has had uh, uh, one of the, I mean, the highest level in real terms in, in the history for uh, a continued period of, of time. So this is what we have seen. I mean, it, I, I, it's hard to remember that in the 90s, this was the normal, uh, you know, about uh, uh, between 15 and 20 uh, uh, um, dollars uh, uh, per barrel. Uh, but by the way, recently there has been a, a decline 
the average in November of the Venezuelan baskets is 94, uh, which is lower than the, the previous uh, uh, two years. Uh, so so there, there are some reasons to, to worry. Then you have the issue of the reserves. And so if you see this graph, you might think that Venezuela discovered a lot of oil recently, but that's not the case. All these reserves, uh, all this oil, uh, 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 it's known for uh, uh, 40 years or more. Uh, uh, the thing is that this is extra heavy oil that at the price and technology of 40 years ago was not commercially uh, by exploitable. Uh, the reason why this has been possible to incorporate this is that in the 90s there was an opening uh, on, of the oil, Venezuelan oil sector that was a state monopoly between 75 and 90 some, 92. And, and some big projects of extra heavy oil were developed with the help of major oil companies in the world, including Conoco, Exxon, and Total. And this allowed, this plus the dramatic increase in the price of oil, the viability of these four projects plus the dramatic increase in the price of oil allowed for these uh, reserves to be uh, included as, uh, as proven reserves. However, and by the way, this, the, the size of the oil in place has been audited by a very reputable uh, international audit firm. So, so, uh, by the way, it's only confirming what PDVSA, by the oil, what the national oil company knew for, for a long time, but, but it gave it international credibility, and now you see it in the BP, in OPEC, in e International Energy Agency figures. The, but the big point is that the auditors said, okay, the, the oil in place in the Orinoco belt is 1.3 trillion barrels of oil. To give you an idea of the magnitude of how much oil is down there, this is more than all the oil that has been consumed in the history of humanity until now. So uh, we, we have not reached 1.3 trillion barrels of oil consumed. But the thing is that this uh, type of extra heavy oil, only a small share of it can be extracted in, uh, with the technology and the, and the, and the economic uh, conditions that we have today. And so uh, the, the, uh, until now, we are, have only been able to recover about an 8% uh, rate of, of recovery. And the government used a 20% rate of recovery. You may ask, why did the government uh, uh, use that? And the reason why is because this allows Venezuela to have the largest oil reserves in the world uh, uh, above Saudi Arabia. And you know, for President Chavez, that, that was a priority. Still, if we, uh, um, um, and, and most of it, as, as, as you can see, it's extra heavy oil. Still, the conventional reserves of Venezuela are very high, uh, much higher than any other country in the region. Uh, and it's huge compared to other countries in, in the world, and as I said, Venezuela has almost 300 years of, of reserves at the current extraction rate. So my point is that even if you use a conservative estimate, and it's not 300 billion, but what Venezuela has in reserves, but 200 billion or a, a bit less, Venezuela has the second largest reserves in the world, and we will not be able to take this oil out of the ground. You know, 300 years, uh, uh, I mean, much earlier than that, this will be obsolete, and we will you know, have a, uh, all the oil down there. Uh, so Venezuela has a very low extraction rate of this, of this reserve. If Venezuela extracted oil at the same rate of their reserves as Saudi Arabia, Venezuela would be producing 12 million barrels of oil instead of three. So uh, this is not feasible, but just tells you a bit about how underdeveloped are the Venezuelan uh, reserves. So we, there are, a, uh, uh, since about four years ago, almost five years ago, there are a few projects that uh, uh, Venezuela, the Venezuelan government offered a, as partnerships with companies around the world, including Chevron, Repsol from Spain, ENI from uh, Italy, Petro Vietnam, CNPC from China, and a Russian consortium. There, there, in fact, there is another Russian, Rosneft, uh, is also there. And basically, these require very large investments because the, this, the quality of the Venezuelan oil is very, very bad. It's, uh, it's extra heavy. And, and in order to be processed in a refinery, it requires either of two things. Either you dilute it with a very high quality oil, a lighter oil, or you upgrade it in a facility that costs about, at this point, about $7 billion uh, uh, for 200,000 barrels. So that, that requires uh, a, a lot of financial resources and also credibility, because who will put $7 billion in a country that Venezuela that just expropriated the oil sector in 2004, 2007? So that's, so that's a big question. So this spectacular opportunity is only matched by the uh, uh, depressing situation of the reality of the oil uh, industry. I mean, oil production has been dramatically declining. This is a other historical period, but as you can see, during the 90s, there was a dramatic increase in production in Venezuela, followed by a significant uh, uh, collapse. And, and this is important to notice that this figure, by the way, includes um, 
at this point, uh, or, or not only crude, but other liquids. But the, the, the big issue here is that about a million barrels of this production come from private investment that eventually was expropriated or nationalized. So without the private investment, the production of Petróleos de Venezuela would have collapsed from about here to about uh, uh, here. You know, it's, uh, 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 so, and the reason is basically lack of investment. Uh, this is the number of oil uh, rigs in operation, and as you can see, in the 90s, it was much higher than the one we have today. And so it's amazing that a company that is receiving the highest oil prices in history is not able to invest uh, uh, enough. And this shows you Venezuela compared to other, uh, uh, other uh, countries. Uh, as you can see, Putin every, every, like all had the same, uh, I mean, uh, the equivalency uh, as one in, 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 uh, when Chavez started in power. Everybody else has in, uh, increased production, and Venezuela is below uh, the, the production in that, in that period. Uh, the other uh, sort of striking fact is that the, the debt of the National Oil Company of Venezuela used to be $3 billion in 2006 is now 45, because these are the figures for last year, but now it's $45 billion, so an increase of uh, like 15 times, you know, in, 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 in a matter of, of six years or so. And on top of that, Venezuela owes, uh, PDVSA owes money to everybody. All the partners, all the contractors are owed, sometimes the arrears are two years of services. You know, it's really uh, uh, appalling. And, the, crazy, the craziest of, of the crazy things that is happening is that the Central Bank of Venezuela is now financing the national oil company. They are basically printing money and giving it to the national oil company to finance operations. At this point, is the equivalent at the official exchange rate of $60 billion, the debt of PDVSA, the oil company with the Central Bank. And, and you could think, okay, has that money uh, that PDVSA got in, uh, from loans been invested? Well, the, the answer is no. Uh, um, I mean, investment, this is uh, 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 the plan for PDVSA, but in reality, uh, as you can see, investment has not gone up uh, 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 significantly, and it's well below the levels that are required to sustain even production. But the red line is the amount of uh, money that PDVSA is either spending in social programs directly or giving it to a fund that the president controls outside of the Venezuelan budget. So the, the, all these red bars are money spent out of the Venezuelan budget directly from the funds of Petróleos de Venezuela in social uh, spending. Uh, exports are, are, are falling even more rapidly than production because the domestic market is increasing spectacularly. And uh, moreover, exports to the U.S. have de decreased dramatically and exports to Asia have increased uh, very significantly. The problem uh, uh, with that is that PDVSA has, say, a production of 2.7 million barrels, or 2.8 until, until last year, uh, but we are giving away free 100,000 barrels to Cuba, uh, half of the production of, of uh, to the countries in the Caribbean that Ambassador Daddy mentioned, others in, in, uh, in South America. Then you have the domestic market, in which basically, you know, I don't know if you know, know that, let me see if I have it here, yes. Uh, the price of gasoline in Venezuela is 0 0.07, so 7 cents per gallon at the official exchange rate, but that uh, that's that's, doesn't exist because nobody gets the, the official exchange rate. So at the black market exchange rate, it's 0 0.01. So you basically when fill I your tank. Just in, as an example, when I lived in Venezuela a short time ago, I could fill my 4x4 four four for well under $2. Well, now it's 25 cents. Now it would be 25 <laughs> cents. That's astounding. So to give you an idea, the, the, the PDVSA, the national company, has to pay the gas station to, 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 for them to receive the gasoline. Otherwise, they will not. You know, because the, the margins are so low that to provide the service, it's more costly than what they charge, the 0 0.01. So, so as you can expect, people are consuming gasoline like crazy, right? Because it's free. And, and of course, about 50 to 40 to 50,000 of these are also benefiting our neighbors in Colombia because it is smuggled uh, to uh, Colombia and a little bit to the Caribbean and, and Brazil. So, but the reputation of Venezuela is at, at the bottom also because, uh, because of the expropriations and the way PDVSA has not been paying its bills, et cetera, Venezuela is, has the worst uh, ranking in the, in the uh, ranking of, uh, of jurisdictions uh, in terms of attractiveness of, of, of investment. Uh, so that's a big hurdle too. The number of employees of PDVSA has dramatically increased, 
I don't know if you know about the episode in 2002, 2003, there was a, a strike in the oil sector against President Chavez in Venezuela, and as a result, he fired about half of the employees of the company. There, was, there were about 40,000, he fired about 18,000. But so the company had 22,000 the next day, but now it has 125,000, uh, and production is going down. So the production per uh, employee is at its lowest uh, almost in, in history. Uh, and the, 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 the goals of production, this is our, the, the plan of PDVSA in 2005 was to produce by 2012 5.8 million barrels. In reality, it produced 2.9. This is official figures. Uh, I mean, some estimates are lower, but this is official figures. So, so this is the plan to go from here to here. This is the reality. Uh, so some perspective for the future. Uh, I, mean, the, the, I mean, and this is sort of the previous plans of PDVSA and reality. So. Uh, but PDVSA is really interested in attracting uh, 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 investment from IOCs because of all these variables. I mean, the NOC is in bad shape. The fiscal situation is critical. I mean, they have to invest in large and risky investment. There are many reasons why the government is desperate to attract investment. So a very ideological, left-wing, radical, nationalistic government is opening the oil sector to uh, 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 oil companies from all over the world to, to, to get in. The only reason, by the way, not to do it is because the price of oil is, is so high that, that, that they are not as desperate as they would be if the price was lower. Uh, but uh, but it, the reality is that it's, uh, it has not been happening. And, and this is are the, 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 uh, the projections of the International Energy Agency of what would happen in Venezuela. As you can see, they project a decline, actually, of production in Venezuela. And then a slow increase. This might look, but, but the axis is 2.5 and 3.7. Uh, so basically, Venezuela will be almost going in 2035 to the production that we had uh, before Chavez. So uh, that's really uh, amazing, and with the largest reserves. So what is ahead for Maduro's oil policy? Much more pragmatism, and we see a lot of it, a, win, a reduction in the windfall tax, uh, a negotiation with Chevron to give a loan to the project that they're producing, which basically Chevron takes complete control over the oil. It used to be the case that PDVSA, that they had to sell the oil to PDVSA, and PDVSA basically didn't pay them. <laughs> and so as a result, Chevron wanted, didn't want to put any money into the project. So now they have, uh, so you hear all this news about foreign companies giving money to the Venezuelan government. I mean, the, the president of PDVSA every week has an announcement. I received $2 billion from this company. and Basically, those are, people that are owed that money, that are putting that into their books as loans instead of being uh, accounts uh, uh, um, receivable, accounts uh, um, uh, payable for PDVSA. So, uh, by the way, PDVSA at this point has all, uh, all the debt and all, everything that I show you, but it also has $40 billion in accounts uh, receivable from uh, Petrocaribe and, and many uh, people that have not paid them. So, most of those are not going to be ever paid. I mean, Cuba will never, ever pay Venezuela for the, for the barrels that it has. Uh, so we see a lot of, of pragmatism, a lot of uh, intentions to attract investment, but I think uh, it will be very hard to, to get. Still, I think there there's going to happen, uh, some of the investment is going to happen, there's going to be an increase in the extra heavy oil production of Venezuela, but it only will mostly match the decline in the conventional, in the, in the traditional areas of oil production in Venezuela that are rapidly uh, declining. So I don't expect a very significant increase, but maybe some increase uh, uh, to the levels uh, uh, that uh, we had a few years uh, uh, back. So let, let me give you uh, uh, only a few points about politics. How, how much time do? Five minutes. Another five minutes, great. So let me tell you a little bit about oil and politics, because I think this is very important to understand how did this happen? You know, you had this company that used to be one of the best-run national companies in the world, uh, Petróleo de Venezuela, that was increasing production spectacularly, and then you had uh, this change in regime and, 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 uh, and a complete mess and a company that is one of the most inefficient and corrupt in the world. How did that happen? Well, first, uh, I want to, to make you to, to tell you about this story. Venezuela had the best performance in Latin America until the 70s, but then it, has the worst, it had the worst economic performance. I don't have time to tell you why this happened. There is a whole book coming out uh, that, in which I am one of the authors called Venezuela, Anatomy of a, an Economic Collapse. If you want to know about it, you have to read the book. Uh, but it's Penn, Penn State University Press. Uh, but, uh, uh, but what I can tell you is that this collapse in the economy 
mostly a, pro, a, a result of the high dependency in oil, the over indebtedness of the Venezuelan uh, uh, co uh, economy, I mean, uh, state, uh, actually the Venezuelan state in, in the 70s, combined with a collapse in the price of oil uh, that brought this spectacular decline that elected Hugo Chavez. Chavez was elected here after all this terrible uh, uh, economic period. To give you the idea, the counterfactual should be for a developing country should be a line that might go like this, but it always goes up, right? It's, it's, that's the normal, uh, uh, um, not to talk about East Asia or China, right? But like the average, you know? Um, so, but then you have the oil boom, uh, and, and, and then you have this very significant increase in, in, that was basically the result of this. We had the largest resource windfall in the history of, of the country and in the history of Latin America. Venezuela received the equivalent of 300% of GDP in 10 years of additional revenues from the increase in the price of oil. Uh, other countries in the region, by the way, benefited very significantly, but none uh, benefited as much as, much as, as Venezuela. And if you see the results, Venezuela has the second to last average growth rate during the last 14 years. Uh, 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 only Haiti did worse than Venezuela. So if you compare what it could have been, the counterfactual of what should have happened with what would happen, it's appalling. It's really appalling. It's true that uh, poverty and, and some social indicators improved because the transfers, the transfers from the resources from the oil sector to social policy were huge. The question is, is this sustainable? And the answer is no. Uh, this is the, the, uh, the electoral budget cycle in Venezuela. This, uh, the moving average of the, of the central government real expenditures. And as you can see, this is the election of 2006. The president basically spent everything that he had to win the elections of 2006. He won by 26 points. Then the, he had, a, of course, to do an adjustment because both the price of oil went down and moreover he had to I mean, balance what he had done in the crazy period before. And then next elections uh, again, you know? And this is an increase that I don't know if you, this is real terms. This is an increase of 50% of the budget in real terms. Venezuela in 2006 had a deficit of almost. Could you go back to that slide? Sure. I'll just make one, one point. <clears throat> in November of 2007, I was the ambassador in Venezuela, um, where you see the, the, the great dip. And I got there after this huge expenditure the previous year. The, the thing that I would, um, I would point out to you ter in terms of Venezuela's um, uh, history is that the president won re-election by a substantial margin, thus evaporating all questions about the legitimacy of his mandate in 2006. But even the Chavistas understood that that kind of spending had to be um, uh, reined in. In 2007, he tried to introduce a series of constitutional reforms, and they held a national referendum. And for the first time since his election in 1998, they lost. What was the lesson for the, uh, the government? Well, it went up again the next time they tried the referendum, and the next time President Chavez himself had to run, it went back up to a level that rivaled the earlier expenses. What they understood was, seemingly, there, there was an absolute correlation between how much the government spent in the period just before the election and the likelihood that they would get the result they wanted. And I will show you that exactly. I mean, the, 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 I mean, the, the deficit last year was 17% of GDP. That is the largest deficit that almost any country in the history of uh, the Western Hemisphere. But this is, you have to realize, when the price of oil is at the highest level in history. Right? So how can this be possible? You know, having a deficit larger than Greece, uh, the countries that are completely broke uh, uh, in the middle of the highest boom in your income? Well, it's possible because of the craziness of the populism that we, that we had. And uh, this is what uh, um, the ambassador was pointing out. The correlation between uh, uh, the expenditure and, and the popularity of President Chavez, which is the blue line, it's, it's very significant. I mean, the, the expenditures was, uh, uh, was the base of President Chavez's uh, popularity. And moreover, and this is, by the way, this is the connection between the evaluation of how people believe they are doing economically, how they are doing in their pockets, this is the dotted line, and the popularity of President Chavez. Uh, I mean, the correlation is 0 0.8, right? So basically, people were voting with their pockets because a lot of money was being distributed. 
the problem is, uh, so, so I wanted, the last point that I want to make is, is it the case that, you know, you, you see this is a country with a revolu socialist revolution, nationalizing everything. Is it the case that Venezuelans have bought this ideology? And the, and the answer is not. This is the, what institutions in the country are doing the best for the country, are, are helping more the country. And let me tell you about the socialist institutions that get the best rating. Shopping malls, <laughs> banks, retail, the Catholic Church, entrepreneurs, university students that are mostly against the government, private uh, production companies of, of uh, food, uh, media, private media, and then the social programs of the government, and then President Hugo Chavez. So is this uh, a socialist country? Uh, um, uh, and the answer is, of course, no. This is a country in which most of the policy preferences of the president were very far away from the median voter, but he bought their support by distributing uh, uh, all this uh, amount of money. And this is another one. Uh, but President Chavez has spent thousands of hours telling us that Cuba was the best economic model in the on world. National on national TV, on, on, on all the channels he could control, all the channels, all the radio stations at the same time having this. And, and the, so how many Venezuelans believe that Cuba is a model for Venezuela? 4%. Uh, 81% think it's a very bad model for the country. By the way, these are the same polls that always showed that President Chavez was going to win. So if you are thinking that I'm presenting you know, a bias, uh, polling, uh, that, that is... Uh, <laughs> uh, so, I mean, and I will end with this. The terrible legacy of, of, the, uh, of left by Chavez will have lasting effects on the, on the stability of the country. One of the big worries uh, that I have is that you saw that, that graph in which I show you that Venezuela had the best economic performance for a while and then a collapse. Well, all the conditions that created the collapse, the heavily indebtedness, the, uh, the, the, the decline in, 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 the, in, in the institutions of the country, et cetera, all uh, times 10 are in place now. So if there is a collapse in the price of oil, I don't know what would happen in Venezuela. It would be an economic collapse of unprecedented uh, uh, characteristic. The opposition, and I have to qualify this because I, I prepared these slides a month ago, and, and this, you know, we have elections on Sunday, municipal elections in Venezuela, and unfortunately, uh, I think that uh, recent populism uh, uh, attempt by the government, you know, basically they, what they did is they forced all retailers to sell the, the, their electrical uh, appliances, et cetera, for half the, their prices, and they got sort of a, uh, 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 sometimes uh, uh, even more. And so th there has been a, 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 a small hike in the popularity of the government recently. But for the first time, the structural fa factors are there to clearly make the opposition uh, a majority uh, uh, in the country. So the question is, what's going to happen? And I think the political of economy of Venezuela will depend a lot on the timing between a full-blown economic collapse and the political transition. But because say there is a political transition and the cost of all this collapse are paid by the new government, uh, then the consequences would be very different than if uh, Nicolás Maduro has to pay uh, all the broken pieces from what they have uh, brought up. In fact, I have a, a little bit of sympathy for the poor Maduro because, because you know, all, all polls show today that Chávez is a hero uh, because he died at exactly the appropriate time. Uh, I mean, he even was lucky at that dying uh, at the correct time. Uh, but but uh, uh, President Maduro is now blamed for everything that is happening in the country, and the guy basically received the the legacy from Chavez. So thank you very much. Oh, that was terrific. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> that's also a, perf a perfect transition for our, our, our next speaker. Let me, <clears throat> let me point out, as we speak <clears throat> in Venezuela, um, to, to, to return to a couple of earlier points, as we speak, they have approximately 50% inflation, 50. And, and at least that's what, and they, they actually think that they may close the year at about 54% inflation. Making it worse, this will be the fifth or sixth year in a row that um, they, have, they have had inflation above 20%. Think just for a moment of what the value of your savings would be if you say started seven years ago with $1,000 in the bank, or at least the erosion of your uh, purchasing power, right? Think of that, just extraordinary. Uh, 
there was a point only a couple of months ago where it had become so difficult to supply certain basic products, like, for instance, toilet paper, that the government had to go out and buy something on the order of 40 million rolls of toilet paper. There wasn't any in the country. <clears throat> the country's foreign reserves are collapsing. And um, what we have seen in recent years ha has been um, uh, you know, an evolution in the way um, the Venezuelan government has conducted its um, negotiations with other countries and with um, some private companies as a consequence of the fact that notwithstanding this extraordinary decade-long windfall, they are short of cash. And as Francisco, um, I think, very aptly points out, there appears to be an absolute correlation between the, the government's ability to fund social programs um, and its support. Not surprisingly, they have borrowed heavily from those willing to loan to them. Because the government has um, uh, uh, postponed the repayment of debt, because of the expropriations, not everyone will loan to them. But China has. And that brings us to our next speaker. Evan Ellis um, is associated with the National Defense University um, in Washington. And um, uh, certainly in my estimation, and I believe in the estimation of, of many others, he probably is um, our leading authority on uh, China's, the, the strategic s significance of China's um, in, uh, uh, investment in Latin America. And I can tell you that this is on, on the minds of policymakers in Washington, something that I've pointed out in one or two other uh, chats that I've, I've given, is that when I was, um, on Cap I was up on Capitol Hill for a um, confirmation hearing before the Senate, um, I had just come out of the position, I was just leaving the position of Deputy Assistant Secretary, where I'd been responsible for a fairly large assistance um, uh, program, among other things, in Haiti. And I was going to the country with the largest oil reserves in the world. The first question I got wasn't about Haiti, and it wasn't about Venezuela, it was about China. Uh, um, and China's uh, role in the hemisphere, and, and the significance of that role for the United States and for the rest of the world. Um, Evan has been publishing on this, um, on this issue uh, for some years, and only about a week or so ago, um, uh, his uh, new book on the subject um, was, uh, was presented in Washington. And I'm, I, I'm going to end with this one point. In, in what I think was an almost unprecedented gen gesture, the presentation of his book uh, um, involved a former Secretary of Defense. I don't know when, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I've ever heard um, of a Secretary of Defense showing up to, to help launch and to underscore the importance of a study such as this. So I think we're getting um, the very latest from the very best, um, Evan Ellis. Thank you very much, Ambassador Dutty, and um, thank uh, uh, Duke, uh, the Energy Initiative, uh, and, and the rest of the programs uh, for, for bringing Francisco and, and myself here to uh, share our views. Um, it, it's really an honor to be able and, and certainly a pleasure to be, to be back uh, here, here in Duke again. Um, let me also say it's, uh, uh, Francisco is, is a very difficult act to follow. Um, thankfully, uh, since he's, I think, presented some of the key points about uh, the, the dynamics in the Venezuela oil sector, um, I'll try to uh, build on what he has done, and, and I think uh, really we are very much in agreement about our, our relatively grim prognosis of what is happening with certainly PDVSA and perhaps with Venezuela more, more generally. Um, but uh, I will try to focus mostly on the aspect of how is China involved um, and what is China and to an extent Russia and Indi India and, and some of uh, the other extra-regional actors um, working uh, with Venezuela and, and uh, contributing both positively and negatively uh, to this dynamic. Um, first of all, just a little bit of background. Um, and again, uh, as with Francisco, I will uh, just hit some of the key points of the slides. But uh, certainly, um, it's important to recognize that uh, China is not a new entry into the Venezuelan oil sector, but that evolution has certainly evolved. Indeed, uh, the first uh, key involvement in the oil sector, um, and really what was at the time the largest 
Chinese um, investment uh, in, 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 the, in the energy sector, at least at that point in time. Um, uh, China National Petroleum Corporation actually won uh, two relatively modest um, concessions, Intercampo Norte and Caracolas, both of which were uh, relatively mature, long exploited fields. Uh, at the time, um, my colleagues in PDVSA saw CNPC as a relatively backward company with low technology and, and indeed uh, really, really kind of uh, spurned many of their efforts. But uh, that has slowly evolved. Um, also, there were a number of other initiatives as the uh, control of Hugo Chavez deepened um, in Venezuela. Uh, so, uh, for example, one of the older concessions, and I mention it here because it's, it's uh, important later, um, a uh, arrangement with China National Petroleum Corporation um, to uh, extract basically the tar sludge in, um, in, in, in the region and uh, convert it not to an oil-like product, but rather uh, basically sell it uh, to power boilers, basically to generate electrical energy in uh, various places, but uh, one of which was a facility that the Chinese had, had built in Zhangzheng um, to, uh, to, to uh, use this. Now, over time, the investment continued to deepen, and so uh, China National Petroleum Corporation was given another oil field uh, in December 2004. Um, like uh, many other companies um, in countries, uh, with the uh, nationalization of the sector 2006-2007, uh, uh, the Chinese had to convert their holdings into joint venture companies um, in which uh, Petavesa had the majority stake. Uh, the Chinese went along with those arrangements while um, at least a selection of some of the other traditional uh, Western transnational oil companies uh, such as such as ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, made the decision to pull out at that point in time. Uh, also, China contributed in other ways directly in the petroleum sector. So, for example, as Venezuela's ability to um, buy uh, capital-intensive items such as the large drilling rigs that one needs, uh, Francisco alluded to the the activity of of those rigs uh, in, in uh, talking about investment. Um, China actually began to first build in China and later through a plant in Venezuela um, an important uh, fraction of, of those rigs. One of the things that got a lot of attention, of course, uh, after the uh, basically the heavy oil blocks in Oronoco had been, um, had been mapped out and, and begun to be uh, leased, were, uh, was that uh, China was one of the early players that was given or at least committed to invest in one of the blocks under the new joint venture partnerships, so Junin 4. This was about the same time that the Russians had invested in a nearby uh, block, Junin 6, um, and uh, there were others, uh, for example, the Ayacucho blocks, the, the Karabobo block, uh, for, for example, um, the, the Indians and, and others had gotten some of those. Just to give a little bit of, of quick um, context here, uh, basically, you had some of the older oil in the Maracaibo region um, and some of the other places. But uh, so this, th the vast majority of this 300 billion barrels of recoverable oil, depending on the recovery rate assumptions that you use, um, really is, is found um, in, in this area. But as Francisco pointed out, it's very difficult to uh, it's very difficult to get out. But so when the Venezuelan government made the, in, made the initiative to begun uh, essentially quantifying it um, and, and had it accepted as oil in uh, the reserves of, of petroleum organizations, um, basically what they did is they divided this region up into four groups of blocks and, and they begun um, then arranging for the development of, of those with, uh, with uh, different companies. I'll go back just very briefly. Um, also want to uh, briefly mention that during this period, from about 2010 until very recently, there were a number of initiatives that were announced but really never happened. Um, so you had, uh, at that point in time, uh, discussion that uh, Chinese companies would be perhaps given um, uh, Junin, the Junin 1 block, um, some talk about uh, being given the Junin 8 block, uh, there's some talk about Boyeka 4, a number, another one of the blocks that, uh, that you just saw. Um, it never... It, it never really happened. And indeed, uh, there's also another component of the petroleum industry, which apart from oil and what we referred to as um, the natural gas, which is associated with that li uh, liquid oil, um, you actually have blocks of things which are mostly gas, what they call non-associated gas. And so independently, Petavesa tried to get into that business as well. And indeed, it's believed that in addition to its oil reserves, Petavesa has some of the most significant uh, reserves of, of natural gas in the world. 
Um, that also has not gone particularly well for, for PDVSA. It's had certain problems. Um, with, without getting into that in the interest of time, we can get into it in Q&A. But uh, suffice it to say, uh, China um, National um, Overseas Oil Corporation was uh, mentioned as a candidate for getting into one of those initiatives of Marisal Sucre, which I believe used to be Cristobal Colon. Um, and again, there are a series of things that were talked about, but very little actual action on the ground. And so um, there has been a new flurry as PDVSA has found itself in this liquidity crisis of new promises and new initiatives. And so for the Chinese, um, that had to do with the uh, trip uh, first by the head of PDVSA, Rafael Ramirez, and then subsequently cemented by um, the, the trip of President Maduro um, to, uh, to China, in which it was announced that uh, two new blocks, uh, June and one, uh, long discussed, was actually being given to the Chinese. Uh, June and 10, which originally was going to be done by other companies, and then PDVSA was going to go it alone, and then they decided, no, let's give it to the Chinese. Um, and there are actually important liquidity reasons um, for doing this. Um, specifically, even if, as we have seen in June and 4, um, the development is played out relatively slowly, um, the initial signing for the rights to develop these blocks are traditionally associated with between several hundred million dollars and sometimes in excess of a billion dollars. So for example, when um, China signed up for June and 4, um, that was associated with a series of payments amounting to about $900 million, essentially cash up front. And we expect that June in 1 and June in 10, again, um, in oil industry terms, um, you know, a billion dollars is not that much money, but it contributes, it's one of the few places where PDVSA can potentially get money up front to continue to try to get through the um, financial crisis that it is experiencing. I, I want to talk in a little bit of detail about uh, Chinese loans. Um, and first of all, to clarify uh, a couple of, of misnomers, because there's been a lot of misrepresentation about the structure of the loans itself and, and their use. Um, first of all, just about everything that the Chinese are doing in Venezuela is actually through these loan vehicles, which creates an element of safety for their transactions and, and that of their companies. And so literally, the purchasing of the drills was funneled through the loan programs. The purchasing of the new oil tankers that they're buying, which are just now beginning to be delivered, was funneled through the loan programs. Um, the purchase during the run-up to uh, the, the, last, um, the last elections of something like two um, million higher uh, appliances, washers, dryers, and things like that was literally funneled through the loan program. Those are all manufactured in China. Yes. So it's Venezuela, quote unquote, purchasing Chinese goods using money they borrowed from China. Exactly, exactly. The, uh, and as a matter of fact, what you see in, in many of these places, is, and I'll explain how this works in, in just a minute, is that very little of the money actually leaves China. It's basically credited to the Venezuelan National Development Bank, Bandas, um, in an account that they have, and then um, that is drawn down to generally purchase Chinese goods and services. And so again, the delivery of the higher appliances, um, the setting up, for example, of a cherry automobile plant, um, the, um, the production of, of ZTE and Huawei cell phones, um, including final assembly in, in Venezuela. Um, these are typically not commercial deals, but basically where China is doing this um, through the, the loan program. Um, because uh, on the other side, what happens is they are repaid uh, through oil, but oil that they control. But before I get ahead of myself, let me uh, explain a few things about this. Some of the first loan deals were actually talked about as far back as 2005. But there are actually, um, in what's commonly referred to as the Fondo Chino, there are actually three separate instruments. Um, the first two were set up early on, which were called the Heavy Investment Fund. Now, technically, the Heavy Investment Fund is referred to in terms of $6 billion blocks. Um, that is, uh, that is approximately $2 billion that's contributed on the Venezuelan side through Fonden. And so basically, PDVSA was putting its own money through Fonden into the account. Um, and on the other hand, um, the, the Chinese, uh, China Development Bank, which is contributing $4 billion. So I'm going to refer to just the Chinese contributions, the $4 billion blocks. And so what you have is that Heavy Investment Fund Phase 1 was set up, the original $4 billion injection. Um, heavy Investment Fund Phase 2 was set up, another $4 billion injection. Um, then a third vehicle was, was set up, what's called the Long Range Large Volume Fund. That was delivered in two tranches. Now, you may have heard about this 
because uh, it was approximately half distributed in dollars. And to, well, I shouldn't even say dollars, in credits for things that could be bought in dollars. So basically a Chinese commitment to provide dollars to Venezuela to, to buy certain things. Um, and about half was just directly credited in renminbi. Um, but, uh, but so after these two disbursements totaling $20 billion, then you also, at about the same time, you had a new commitment to another $4 billion. So basically, this was dispersed and paid off. The account balance goes back to zero. And so um, another $4 billion injected into this fund, another injected into this fund. And so the total amount through China Development Bank has been $36 billion. Now, there are a number of things announced, but that didn't happen. So you actually get lots of references to other um, levels of commitment. Can you just mention how they paid them off and what, and what, if you will, currency they paid them off? Exactly. OK, wonderful question. So basically, the way that this is structured, and it's, it's slightly different. Um, first of all, the structure of it, you have uh, essentially, um, you have essentially within accounts in China Development Bank, in China itself, you have um, Bandes, the development bank, setting up an account. And so the $4 billion is basically a credit by China Development Bank to a Bandes account in CDB. Now, that account then is drawn down, typically to do various projects and purchase products by Chinese companies, including service, service companies, petroleum service com companies, et cetera. Now, in order to repay that, there is actually a second parallel account in which essentially um, Chinese companies, and to go back just for a second here, if, um, it's often thought that oh, this money is coming out of the Orinoco tar belt, but it's actually not. Um, the vast majority of production, which is oil production, which has been used to pay back these loans, actually comes from the Sinovenza joint venture, which was originally to, to develop ormulsion, but, uh, but then later was converted to upgrading the petroleum um, to, uh, to develop a type of, of synthetic uh, crude. But uh, so, so basically what happens is China National Petroleum Corporation, who basically controls the production in conjunction with PDVSA, delivers oil to, um, to a, a shell organization um, called, called China Oil, which then um, receives that and then credits a certain amount of money to the Bandes account. Now, there's also been some confusion about the actual dollar volume, the dollars received. And there's two numbers that are important to, to not mix up. One of the numbers is the reference price used for the oil. And so there is a need to calculate, well, how many barrels per day do we need to ship just to pay off the interest and, and, and pay off the loan? And so, for example, and, and Francisco was showing how the oil prices fell through the floor. And so back when this loan was first negotiated, um, it, was in the, it was in the $50 range. Uh, Venezuela oil typically receives about $9 or so less per barrel because of, of quality uh, you know, uh, API issues. Um, and, and so the actual reference price, I think about 40 in one case and $50 a barrel in the other case, were not that far out of, of, of market, uh, uh, market realms. But so what happens is based on that calculation, they said, well, to repay this loan, about 100,000 barrels a day is the delivery rate. But the amount of money in dollars or renminbi actually credited to the account when delivery is taken is not based on that reference price, but is actually based on a market price plus, um, you know, plus, plus a markup. Now, it is true that lots of people close to the Chavez and now Maduro regime have made a lot of money off of that intermediation. Um, however, the notion that Venezuela is only getting half of the price that it should for its oil based on locked into a long-term contract is actually at least a little bit wrong. So I just wanted to, to, to correct that. But uh, um, now the other interesting point is this, at this point in time, some of the early funds were not directly tied to projects. There was a certain amount of discretionality in how this was going to be used by, by Bandas. Um, however, um, more recently, um, what, what, what you have is you had Nicolas Maduro going over looking for more money. Initially wanted basically at least $10 billion not tied to any particular Chinese projects. Um, the Chinese who have actually had very, very bad experiences over, over the past years. Um, actually, it, it's actually interesting because what you find is that the way the Chinese, both in February during the trip of, of, of then um, Foreign Minister Haua, um, and now the um, and, and, and now the, uh, um, and, and of course, uh, now the, the trips by Ramirez and, and then Maduro, um, 
it was a classic saving face measure. They actually appeared to increase their commitment to Venezuela, but are actually decreasing the commitment. And so basically they announced, okay, we're going to commit to um, June and 1 and June and 10. That doesn't actually imply that they will put any investment in that, but it appears that they are signing up for more. Um, they also said, they said we're, they privately declined to give the $10 billion in non-tied loans, but actually said, okay, we are going to give $5 billion in loans, all of which are explicitly tied to the purchases of, of you know, Chinese projects um, and petroleum service things. So, for example, a lot of that money appears to be tied to bringing up production um, in the areas under Chinese control, basically to ensure that they can pay back their, their, their own loans. Um, I also should briefly mention that as with the other uh, oil companies that, that Francisco mentioned, um, you actually have one interesting, basically non-Fondo non Chino engagement here, which is that uh, China Development Bank has given an additional $4 billion um, to, to PDVSA. But it's interesting because that loan, you say, well, this is a big risk because it's not directly part of the Fondo Chino. But what's happening is it's giving that money basically to itself because it's loaning the money to a project which is controlled by CNPC, um, which is essentially known heavy oil, which is being used to repay the Chinese loan. And so basically, it's, it's almost an in-house thing where they're doing it to make sure that they can continue to, to pay themselves. Um, and also briefly, I should mention that there was another series of initiatives, and there actually sometimes is competition between different Chinese entities. And so um, about a year and a half, two years ago, uh, you actually had another bank, a more commercial bank, um, International Commerce and um, Bank of, of China, coming in and saying, we want to maybe loan money outside of the fund for some projects to support our Chinese business partner, um, CIDIC, who was at the time doing some construction work um, uh, near, near, the, near the capital and was also talking about building one of these massively expensive upgraders that uh, Francisco uh, alluded to in the, in the Chinese sector. Um, now, most of that has not happened. As a matter of fact, to the best of, of my knowledge, none of that has yet happened. Um, although it remains a possibility. Okay, um, having dwelt on that, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go through some of the things. Of course, we already kind of talked about the Chinese position uh, in the country. Um, just briefly, I wanted to mention that um, one of the important aspects of the Chinese participation is that they are probably the, the best bet in a number of difficult areas where Petavese is in crisis. Um, now, refining has not yet become felt as a crisis because um, before you can have a crisis with the refineries, you have, to have, you have to overcome the crisis of production, which is actually declining rather than increasing. Um, however, uh, the refineries, as it was seen by the Amway, uh, fi the Amway explosion. Um, the Amway was a major refinery, the biggest, right. and there was a, uh, an explosion a little over a year ago, yeah. killed about 30 people, and it hasn't come fully mm. back on, in, into production yeah. yet. Um, and, and in addition, literally the other refineries, there are multiple fires each, each year, et cetera, et cetera, um, and, uh, including, I, I think, in, um, in uh, Puerto de la Cruz, uh, or uh, I think it was Puerto de la Cruz, there was just a fire last, last month. Um, and it's interesting, actually, to look at Puerto de la Cruz to, to realize that a Chinese-based company, uh, not a Chinese name, but a Chinese, uh, China-based company, is, is actually providing some of the, the services to try to um, support uh, that, that refinery. Now, when you look at the picture abroad, um, some of basically call it the near abroad for, for Venezuela, um, the Citgo, basically everything is falling apart because the Citgo refineries, which PDVSA used to own and could basically oblige to accept its oil, now that they are no longer owned, they are actually turning, interestingly enough, to Canadian uh, tar sands oil, which contractually, in terms of quality, is seen as is somewhat more reliable and they prefer to work with the Canadians. Um, so I actually had a case of, of one company, Newstar, um, basically owned over a Houston-based refinery that actually paid the penalty to get out of its contract with PDVSA, I think, three months early so they could turn to buying Canadian crude. Um, so this is becoming an increasing problem, especially as uh, PDVSA continues to try to sell um, what's called early production oil, which has some significant quality uh, and residue, uh, residue problems with it. You have two other near refineries, um, one that's been operating in Curaçao. The Curaçao government is increasingly putting pressure on PDVSA to put the billions of dollars worth of investment that they promised and are contractually obliged to put in that refinery in. Um, it's a, between a rock and a hard place because the Curaçao can't 
can't refine anybody else's oil, but um, Pedavesa depends on them, especially because they have a very important deep water port where some of the bigger tankers want to load that, that they can't uh, do, for example, in the Paranagua Peninsula. Um, you have the Aruba refinery that just came back online, but it's very dubious that this refinery, um, which Pedavesa seems to be talking about perhaps renting, um, if Pedavesa doesn't have money for anything else, where is it going to come up with, with that money? You have the Brazilian refinery um, near Pernambuco, uh, Abru e Lima refinery, which basically after years of Pedavesa not coming up with its promised share, the Brazilians finally said, we're going to go for it on our own. And my reason for going through this is that as you try to talk about these plans, and Francisco's presentation is excellent, where, you know, you know, production keeps going down, but here's all these ambitious plans of, of Pedavesa to, to go up. Well, if you ever actually successfully go up, you're going to need that heavy oil refining capability. And right now, the only game in town for heavy oil is the 400,000 barrel per day Guangdong refinery that CNPC is building on its own um, in China. Um, Francisco pretty much covered the upgraders. I, I just wanted to touch on a couple issues. This is an area where Petavesa keeps trying to avoid making that. And you're not talking about just one seven to eight billion dollar upgrader. You're talking about each individual project needing um, its own um, perhaps four to five, perhaps as much as seven to eight billion dollar upgrader. And so what Petavesa has tried to do to, to basically get cash is that it has tried to sell as long as possible what they call early production. Um, it basically, instead of upgrading it, it has basically tried to dilute it with things like naphtha so that it can at least get it to the refinery and sell it. Now, part of the problem is Petavesa does not have the storage capability that it needs to let the residues settle. And so essentially, it's selling oil that um, basically you have residues settle out in the tankers. You have issues with quality at the refineries themselves. And so the refineries are getting pretty pretty frustrated with accepting this oil. And there's actually a pretty high rejection rate for Petavesa oil deliveries. I think it's probably one of the highest, if not the highest, uh, in, the, in the industry. So this is a bit of a time bomb itself if you don't put the billions of dollars you need into, into these, these, these upgraders. Um, and once again, um, China is looking as one of the few places where you can do this. OK, so let me cut to the chase in the interest of time here. Um, one final thing, also, as China moves towards selling, um, at least China, China, between China and India, they are buying a, over a third of Petavesa's current production, about going from zero Venezuela oil sold to Asia in 2005 to 1.1 million barrels a day, at least officially. Um, not all of that actually goes to China, but if you think about the number of tankers you have to keep in the water to maintain that, Petavesa needs to buy, basically expand rapidly its new fleet of tankers. But again, because it has no money, that's not happening. And some of the few Petavesa tankers that are actually getting delivered, keeping it from having to rent other tankers at high expense, are coming from China, bought ironically through the heavy loan fund. OK, um, we can get into the difficulties, um, but uh, let me come back. And I, and I think I, I think Francisco and I depressingly concur. Um, with respect to the outlook. And if you really think about it, what it comes down to is that Petavesa is running into problems at all fronts. And so as we talked about, production's going down. Um, if you take out some of the, some of the, the, the liquids, um, you know, one estimate is, is 2.4 million barrels a day. And the Petavesa portion, the, the non-private portion of that, as Francisco pointed out, um, is, is just collapsing. Um, you have the issue that of that production, you have this questionable um, early, early production crude. Um, at the same time, also, as Francisco pointed out, you have rising internal consumption. So production going down, internal consumption. So that puts the squeeze on what you actually export. Also, as Francisco and Patrick pointed out, then the money that you can get from what you export, um, you have the 100,000 barrels a day that you have to, you're committed to give to Cuba for essentially nothing. You have the oil that you give to Petro Caribe, uh, like another 300,000 barrels a day, um, basically. And you only receive about half of the payments in the future for that. You have the oil that you're committed to, that you've gotten the money from the Chinese previously under the China Fund that you now are using to repay. And oh, by the way, all of these new deals that Petavesa is now signing to try to get its partners to invest more to bring production online, um, I think that's all coming with even more promises of future oil deliveries. And so more and more, um, so Petavesa can't get credit, so it's promising future oil. So the amount of oil that's not already obligated is very rapidly going towards, is, is very rapidly going towards zero. 
Um, and then, of course, as we alluded to, that of that which it has, then you have issue of the diversion of profits, you have the, the, the spending on the misiones and, and, and uh, the, um, the development fund, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so the depressing situation um, is that it's taken about a decade for Pedavesa with record high oil prices to completely run out of options to rob Peter to pay Paul. But both Peter and Paul are broke, which now creates a situation in which um, the ability to buy continuing political support is now becoming in question at a moment when you have somebody in power who is not seen as a Hugo Chavez, who is, who is seen as talking to birds. Um, and, and, and so you see a convergence of worrisome trends. Um, and there's a real consensus that the situation is not sustainable. And what many people I think that we have talked to is not the question of will this go on, but things are not going to end well. And the question is how and when will it all play out? Um, so thank, thank you very much. Again, an honor. <laughs> That's absolutely terrific. I, I know just to, to, you know, to put uh, yet, yet another um, uh, gloss on all of this, um, we got a question in an earlier session with faculty um, uh, about why it is, um, uh, given the circumstances in, in Venezuela, and concentration of control in the executive, um, uh, absence of an independent judiciary or legislative branch, et cetera, which someone pointed out might well describe China, um, why it is that with um, so much money being diverted from oil revenues to pay for social programs, um, the situation is different in, in Venezuela when mightn't the same be said about Mexico? And the answer to some of those questions is yes, but. Yes, but, um, for instance, Mexico is a more diversified economy. Yes, but the, um, uh, the oil revenue constitutes a smaller part of the federal budget in Mexico. Yes, but there's a much higher level of confidence in Mexico's ability and willingness and, and if you will, commitment to paying things back. Similarly, in China, there are varying levels of, uh, uh, um, you know, of, of difficulty or complications, but there's a much higher level of competence and confidence um, in, in that sector. Venezuela's case, um, now not talking about um, the, the oil company per se, but the government, it's, it's worth noting that Oil constitute, oil revenues constitute over 98%, over 98% of export revenue, um, and over 40% of the government's budget, if you accept the official exchange rates, it may well be much, a much, much higher percentage of the government's budget. And, um, and the government has undertaken enormous social programs but not very efficiently, and also substantially increased um, the, uh, the government employment roles. So they desperately need money, um, hence the, um, their willingness to, um, you know, to act in the very near term in ways that almost certainly ensure um, a, a cascading uh, series of difficulties into the future. So we're, with, with that, um, why don't we take a few questions? Yes, no? Evan. So I'm really interested in, uh, thanks again for speaking today. You commented on uh, what may happen in elections and that for the first time there's you know, kind of a structural majority of the opposition. What are they campaigning on in terms of policy with oil, gas, and Venezuela? And what is their way forward and way to correct all these issues? Okay, le well, le let me say one thing. I just got the last poll and... and uh, Literally while he was sitting here. Yes. So the, there, there has been a bump of 10% in favor of Maduro uh, in, in the last month or four. Uh, Unbelievable. Uh, so, uh, so, the, so they actually might win the, 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 the national vote. Uh, in the, but this is a municipal election, right? So in municipal elections, as you can imagine, the debate is not about oil policy or anything like that. But let me tell you about what happened in the previous election. In the, in the, in the previous election, the opposition did not have uh, 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 a lot to say about, about oil in terms of details about policy uh, uh, publicly. I mean, of course, privately, it's a different, different story. But in terms of uh, platform, the main things that the 
presidential candidate of opposition said was, first, that the same thing as the government, they want to increase uh, uh, production significantly, but uh, they could do it compared to the government because the, the, the companies will uh, have more, more trust uh, in, the, in, the, in the opposition team and, and in the institutional uh, setting and the, the spreads of, uh, of that will go down and so that will allow PDVSA to finance uh, a lot of the projects and that kind of thing. The other big uh, part of the policy platform was eliminating all the subsidies to the Caribbean and Cuba in particular. So that's about $7 billion that Venezuela gives away a, a, every year, uh, depending on, on the way you uh, estimate it. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a chunk of money. But as uh, Ambassador Dodi said, one of the big problems is that for some of these countries, this is the main subsidy that they are receiving. I had a, um, uh, uh, in, in a conference, I don't remember exactly where, but here in the US, uh, a, a high official from the government of Haiti telling me that the most significant subsidy to Haiti today that is not totally uh, controlled in terms of, uh, you know, it's, it, that, it, that they, they have some discretion uh, is it's the Venezuelan subsidy. So it's the most, he said, basically, you, we will be broke if Venezuela cut us off. And, and that's peanuts for Venezuela, so please don't do it. Uh, if, if, so, so that, so, uh, so there is a lot of talk, even with the current government, of, of diminishing these subsidies, and they made some announcements. But I think that they have not gone through in terms of really being serious about cutting the subsidies, because otherwise we will have hear the the panic from the Caribbean. I mean, we'll we'll probably uh, uh, see it from the other side. What about Cuba, though? Is Cuba a different case? Do you think for the opposition? Well, Cuba. I mean, the opposition said that they will completely cut them off. But I think pragmatically it will be very hard to do because, you know, today we have, are infiltrated by Cuban, uh, uh, you know, military advisors and uh, whatnot. So, so I think that the opposition had, will have to be relatively pragmatic about how, how to deal with, with Cuba. But that, that being said, the official announcement is what we will cut the next day. Uh, and by the way, the Cubans owe, owe us billions of dollars, so, so, uh, so you will have to cut a deal in, 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 in any case. Uh, and I think, by the way, that the, the programs, in terms of the doctors, it, it, it are relevant. You cannot, uh, you, 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 I mean, the opposition should try not to. Uh, the, the Cubans um, send arguably thousands of doctors um, to Venezuela to work in the, um, the poor uh, neighborhoods in, uh, under the auspices of a program called Barrio Adentro. Now, many of those, uh, these little local clinics actually fail, right? The, the doctors abandon the clinics, um, seek to emigrate, in part because they're paid um, uh, peanuts yes. for doing it. The, the, um, in, in, a, in effect, their compensation actually goes to Cuba in the form of oil. They get to Venezuela, though, and they go, wait a minute. Um, this isn't the best I can do, if I, if I leave this or if I get into Colombia, if I go to Brazil, or goodness knows if I get to the United States, I'll do very well indeed. So many of these doctors have abandoned their posts. Right? Um, uh, and, and there have even been inter international organizations who have noted that forcibly keeping them there is, in fact, a form of indentured servitude. Um, now, that said, the fact that the government supported putting clinics in poor neighborhoods was very, is very popular, very popular among the poor. Uh, um, I, and, and, you know, there are, I'm sure we all have anecdotes which, um, which speak to this, but the, the poorest barrios in Venezuela are not only very, very poor, um, uh, transportation is miserable, there are, vir there are virtually no services or were no services available before this, they're very, very violent. You're not going to get most ambulances or doctors to come into um, Katia or, or Petari, some of these really poor barrios in, in, in Caracas after midnight under any circumstances. And so the residents think the Comandante, Hugo Chavez, did us a big favor. Now, it may be that in macroeconomic terms, this was not a good way to proceed. But Hugo Chavez's base was the poor. And as far as they're concerned, um, they were getting something out of this relationship with Cuba that they considered very, very important. Talk to any parent who can suddenly get, his, uh, get, get a child medical attention at 2 in the morning 
when that was not available before, and they will tell you that the quality of their lives improved. It's not a small thing. I, and I thoroughly concur with both Francisco and, and Ambassador Dali's uh, comments. Just a couple other quick things, because there are, for me, layers of irony in, in these elections. Um, on the one hand, even though they are being municipal elections focused on, on local issues, um, both the opposition and the government has tried to make them a referendum on, on the Maduro government, particularly since this is the first major test coming after the, you know, the, the of course, the, uh, you know, the, the last elections. Um, now, having, having said that, um, Basically, whichever way they go, and it does appear that uh, the opposition is likely to be disappointed, but with whatever happens, um, things are likely to get worse. I mean, if, we, if the opposition wins, as we've seen traditionally previously, it's, it's likely that Maduro will actually become more radicalized and more encouraged in, in proceeding with um, you know, the war on inflation and, th and things like that and radicalize the revolution. Uh, the opposition will become less engaged. Uh, if the opposite occurs, if the opposition wins, uh, you will actually see, as we've also seen in the past, um, the opposition becoming um, more confident and, and more bold, um, and the government taking more extrajudicial steps to try to, 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 to control them. So whichever way the municipal election goes, there's no vehicle for political change, and yet there's every reason to expect that things will get much worse. And, and just briefly on the parties, I think it's also important to recognize that there are various different factions internally that are allied within Chavismo um, or within the Bolivarian socialism, which are allied with different external groups. And, and so, for example, um, there are cert certain groups who you might consider the ideologues, uh, people uh, in which camp you might put Maduro or, or Jaula, um, who's the who, foreign minister, right, who are supported because of that orientation by the Cubans. Um, and so if that faction gains within Chavismo power, you can expect that to some degree the, the person that ends up basically paying when the crisis begins to unfold will be disproportionately um, you know, others, whether it's, uh, whether, whether it's uh, you know, Western oil companies or things like that. Reciprocally, um, there's another group, uh, the Bolo Bourgeoisie, um, the, the group that uh, um, most closely allied with the now uh, Speaker of the, the House, uh, Diostal Cabello, um, other people like uh, former uh, defense official uh, Henry Rangel Silva, et cetera, who are seen as very, very corrupt um, pragmatists, but uh, who are no friends nor befriended by the Cubans. Um, the Cubans desperately don't want to see them get the upper hand because, again, if they have the upper hand in a crisis, the person that gets thrown off the bus is most likely to be the Cubans. And so the point I'm making with this is that, at least in my humble opinion, the real coming struggle isn't so much about what could happen between the opposition um, and the Chavistas, but rather it is the way that the factions within Chavismo will play out and what that implies for um, and the types of alliances and support one can expect from the foreign allies attached to those different alliances. Another question? Yeah, Andrew. Uh, and this is, this is more so for you. Um, can you explain why Venezuela's oil exports to China are only valued at about 10% WTI, whereas exports to India are like 75% WTI uh, prices? That's according to some of the surveys we've seen. What's the dollar value of, of an export of a barrel to the United States versus the dollar value to Venezuela of, of, of a barrel to China versus the dollar value to India? Yeah, I got you. And, and I think part of the issue is, is there's been a lot of, of misreporting on, on, on this and a lot of confusion. Um, my, it, it goes back to the, the Fondo Chino. I mean, um, my understanding is that the amount of oil that is sold outside of the Fondo Chino um, is basically going, going at market price. Um, and of course, as you know, because of the low API of Venezuelan oil, that, you know, that of course is at a discount, but not that much of a discount. But I, my understanding is it goes back to that difference between the, um, the reference price, which was used in the contract, um, and the actual um, price which is used for the credit which is given at the time of delivery. And my, so my understanding is that the, the actual credit that is given, so in effect, the price that they are receiving for the oil used to repay the debts under the Fondo Chino, is, my understanding is, is there is a, a substantial margin, and that has to do with um, 
that has to do with the transport costs, which as long as PDV Marine does not yet have enough of their own fleet, that you know, they're, they're eating that. And of course, there's a substantial you know, intermediation which goes to people allied with, with Chavismo. But all of that while a lot, but we're still talking about a couple dollars a barrel. We're not talking about half or 10%. Now, I mean, if you have other figures, I mean, let, let's talk after, after, after the break. But I think it's then if you then deduct the full cost of those barrels, which are being used to repay the debt, that that brings I think, the. I think it might be what, what you might be referring is that what PDVSA gets gets right. back, but that's not what what they are paying because uh, the thing is that this money was already uh, given uh, as a loan to the Venezuelan government, right? So the if, if the analysis if the if the analysis that you're seeing is about the cash flow of PDVSA. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's very low, but if you are seeing about what the, the Chinese are actually paying, I agree with him, it, it seems to be market price, I mean, with the difference that have to do with transport costs and the like. And, I mean, there, and get, get there are, for example, the, what they call the Excedente del Fondo Chino. Um, so basically, the money that gets left over after this transaction then gets recuperated by PDVSA. But as Francisco pointed out, that is not the full amount being received for the Chinese oil. That's just a, you know, a part of the larger that's, transaction. That's what actually comes back. Yeah. Exactly. And amazingly, it doesn't get back directly to an account to PDVSA, but the bandes, the Venezuelan Bank of Development, and, and so they have to politically struggle to get it back. And even, so yeah. even that may not even be coming back. Even that may not be coming back. Sunfield. Yeah, um, my question is that uh, China's uh, investment equity financial also is uh, uh, So what are the risks, do you think, the risk for, and this is this. This is. Let me try to give you a relatively short answer on on, on that. Um, I, I think initially, and I've I've talked to a lot of my Chinese colleagues, and and I'm not fully convinced of of where the truth actually lies. I think the risks are substantial, but not as high. This, where to start with this? Okay. Um, I, I think how the Chinese got in. I, I think first of all, obviously, the Chinese have large experience in African countries such as, such as Angola doing these state-to-state -state deals where as long as the Chinese are physically in control of the production, um, things have up until now worked out. And so I think in many ways Venezuela was seen in that same way. Um, and indeed it has proceeded in that fashion. Um, moreover, you have multiple pushes within the Chinese bureaucracy. And so uh, you know, clearly there was a green light within within uh, China, you know, beginning un under, uh, well, really under Jiang Zemin, later under Hu Jintao, and then certainly now under Xi Jinping, um, to proceed. Having done that, of course, then China Development Bank, which is largely a policy bank, says, okay, we want to support development. Um, moreover, um, you know, as, as you know, internal markets on projects in China, especially after the expenditure of something like $800 billion for the stimulus package, um, there aren't a lot of good, safe bets inside China. And, and, and that's actually not that much of CDB's mission. And so CDB is looking for places to park its money. It has this country, which has been blessed by the government, um, which has an enormous appetite for loans, um, and, and w keeping with CDB's mission, virtually everything that it does is supporting Chinese companies. It's supporting XCMG, it's supporting you know, CNBC, et cetera. And so I think initially there was this push. Now, suddenly, and you might have seen the report uh, that, that, that came out by, uh, um, by a colleague of mine, Kevin Gallagher, um, about uh, you know, the new China, the new banks in town that, uh, well, you know, how did we get to this point where almost 60% of all Chinese lending in Americas are to, to Venezuela? Um, and it was interesting because during the transition, um, a number of colleagues of mine um, who are not officially with the government but working with certain institutions like CICIR, um, I, I interpret to be speaking with some knowledge of the government's position on this. Um, suddenly in Washington, around February of this year, when everything was looking pretty pretty bleak, and we're hearing about, for example, uh, Maduro talking quietly with the Chinese, uh, not Maduro, but, uh, um, but, uh, um, but Kapriles Rodonsky talking quietly with the Chinese, you, you hear the Chinese voices saying, well, we don't know how we got this deeply, and we're concerned about this, and you know, we've had lots of frustrations, and, and we know that the CDB teams, uh, not just Chen Huan, but but the CDB technical teams were very critical of, of the execution of projects being paid for by Chinese money. And so, and there's a whole list of things. I mean, they, 
Um, the Venezuelans have diverted funds um, that should have been gone to repay the Fondo Chino, but actually they tried to, to sell the oil in the, to Gulf Coast refineries with, so they could get cash for it. Um, there has been the issues with the nationalizations. There has been the issues with the corruption of the Fondo Chino. Um, I mean, only $84 million, so it's you know, peanuts in oil terms. But, uh, um, but so enormous risks. I think the part of the reason that they got in this deeply was this push. But I think at the same time, there's also those who have chosen to stay, and it's not just the Chinese, because um, Chevron has made a similar bet. Repsol has kind of made a similar bet. Um, at least some of the Russians, Style I mean, oil. Igor Sechin. E and I. Yeah. Um, each of the bets, I think, is subtly different. But I think the Chinese have made the biggest bet, and so there's the sense that um, at the end of the day, even if Venezuela descends into violence and chaos, eventually some government is going to emerge, and eventually somebody is going to come up with a contract for, 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 for the oil. Um, you know, who is Venezuela more dependent on than, 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 than the Chinese? Um, I, th I, th I think that's a, a very good point. First, I think one point that you stress in your presentation that uh, you didn't point out that much now is that you know many of these loans are, are repaid by oil and it's sort of are, are credit lines rather than actual loans, you know, and, and so they, they are being, they give you more money if you give me more oil. It's sort of a revolving credit line. Uh, that's one that's thing. A, that's a good distinction. Uh, the, yeah. the, other, the other issue is that, as he pointed out, uh, the Chinese government has better uh, tools to defend their property rights in Venezuela than, say, Chevron. Uh, because, uh, I mean, they have all these uh, loans and this future uh, sort of potential relation that it's much bigger than what an American uh, or independent company can, can offer. So in that sense, they feel more protected. Having said that, as uh, some Chinese officials in Venezuela tell you, I mean, if that's the way they treat their friends, I cannot imagine how they treat their, their enemies because, you know, the Chinese have been expropriated, have been not paid, have been, you know, have suffered a lot. But still, in the end, they uh, face much less risk uh, as other players that do not have any way of enforcing their contracts. Let me just say briefly also, um, Chevron, um, in, in ways that Chevron cannot, in ways that any cannot, in ways that Repsol cannot, China can tie together its oil leverage, its government leverage, and in other sectors. Now, I don't know if this story is absolutely true, but it was um, when Maduro began declaring the war on the stores, um, basically almost inviting um, people to come in and, and basically take goods out of the stores at, at a discount. Um, it, my understanding is they began doing that with some of the Chinese shops as well, but the current Chinese ambassador basically quietly said, if you want the $5 billion loan to Vedavesa to happen, um, you will not touch the Chinese stores. And so I think there are vehicles for protection, as, as Francisco pointed out, that the Chinese have. That doesn't mean that they're gonna be completely safe, but it helps. <coughs> and then, yeah. Um, one, um, doing a paper actually read that Venezuela is actually now the biggest importer of gasoline from the United States. Yes. So it's strange how that plays out this year after all the facts that we've seen. The producers of that we, I don't think 15 years ago, we imported it gasoline from the United States and we were able to produce. Well, it's it, it, and just, a, a, just to interject something, one of the curious things about current circumstances um, is that because they have invested so little in um, either upgrading or refining, notwithstanding the fact that total exports to the United States have gone down, there, the energy relationship with the United States is virtually as important to Venezuela as it ever was. But it, it, it as I used to say when I was still um, officially involved, effectively, they're a lot less important to the United States than they, want, than they once were because we have well, we're producing producing more, and Canada is producing more, and 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 we have other sources of oil. So, um, this this for the Bolivarians who have made it a matter of state policy to try and create some separation between Venezuela and the United States. This this has been something of a, a bitter pill to swallow, and um, as critical as some people are of Venezuela, uh, it seems to me it, it was not fundamentally wrong-headed to think about diversifying their markets. Um, you, know, you know, most national leaders 
would understand the, um, the wisdom of, of um, ensuring your, your national economy against the fluctuations of a foreign economy over which you have no control. But they spent so much on the social programs and on buying arms from the Russians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that many parts of the national infrastructure um, have deteriorated very substantially. And the refining capabilities of the country are right there at, at the heart of all of this. I think it's important to, to notice that we did import uh, from a long time ago uh, gasoline from the US, but a small percentage, like the 30,000 barrels. And the reason was because the, the Venezuelan mix is so heavy that for higher octane uh, products, you needed uh, some inputs. Uh, and they, they sometimes came from the US, from elsewhere, but it was small. It has in, uh, increased dramatically, and particularly last year because of the Amway accident, it increased even further. But in average now, it's closer to 100,000 barrels of, of imports. And, part, and that's particularly dramatic, given that you have to sell it for zero in the, in the domestic market. So it's right, really- And that's the other part. So it's, so it's an incredible it's really, really crazy yeah. on the public purse. I, I've just been given a signal which indicates we're all about to get kicked out of here. Uh, um, so I'd like to thank our, our visitors once again, um, as, as well as Sanford, Fuqua, the Canadian Studies Program, the Energy um, Initiative, and the, the, and the Provost's Office for, for making all of this possible. Thank you very much.